There's no greater love than this. You have overcome the grave. Your glory fills the highest place. What can separate me now? You tore the veil. You made a way when you said that it is done. And when the earth fades, falls from. got a, qu a different message today, twofold. When you make decisions in life, do you talk to the Lord first, or doesn't it matter whether he knows or not? Because when you talk to the Lord, when you make a decision, it can save you a lot of money. People think God is in their planes, but a lot of times he isn't. And we got to make sure in these last days, because of the terrible corruption all over the place, we need to call upon the Lord. Christians are drawn into corrupt decisions because that's the world system operates. I've been in the business world a while and I know how it works. You pat my back and I'll pat yours. That's how things are. And it doesn't matter what the product is many times. So we need to understand as we get closer to the end, we'll need to call upon the Lord more and more as we make those decisions because of the deception of the enemy. He'll, he'll sound as an angel of light. And he is coming back soon for a bride. And that bride is going to be without spot or wrinkle made so by the blood of Jesus. So the question is, when will Jesus come back? What do we still expect to happen? The Bible teaches us when you see these things come to pass. Look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draw of nigh. What things? All you have to do is go on the internet and you see incredible, thing, uh, horrible weather uh, taking place, earthquakes and unbelievable destruction all over. So we know that these things are happening. And it also says, man's hearts will fail them for fear. And men will lose their love for one another. The abortion clinics are incredibly business outfits. For those who watch the movie Unplanned, that should make it pretty clear on how what happens there. When I watched it, I was thinking of all the millions of babies that could be alive today and Jesus would could cut his work short because he's got a number. 
He's got a number that he has to fill up, and he knows exactly the time when it'll be. And that's the day when Jesus will say, okay, my son, it's time for you to bring your bride home. So how will that take place? It's interesting how the Bible describes it in the Old Testament. So today I'll let you know from an Old Testament perspective on the coming back of Jesus. But before we get into it, let's rise and ask the Lord for blessing. Heavenly Father, you will open our eyes and hearts to the signs of your coming, to the signs that we see all around us, and help us to just bring our hearts into a place where we can have a relationship with you. I thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. In 2 Peter, in chapter 3, in verse 9, it tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us. Is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. That means all. The Lord is not willing any perish. And because they're perishing, it's because they make their decision against God. How will the end time harvest happen? We can now see and hear rumblings of incredible moves of God. We can see things taking place in the natural that will translate into the spiritual. When you look at what happened in the Old Testament when they were into their uh, harvesting, which is always a blueprint of the harvest of Jesus. First of all, there were the first rains. They would plant, uh, they would, uh, plant their fields and then they would get a rain, which would germinate the plants or the seeds. And then it, that was pretty sufficient rain. And then they would have an almost drought-like condition for quite a while. They would get little rains, but not enough just to keep things going so that the plants would root down to bring up the, the, the nutrients of the soil. I always tell my wife, don't water the garden too much or else you're just going to eat nitrogen when you eat that carrot. I used to sell minerals to cow cattlemen whenever there was a wet year. The cows would need so much minerals. It was a good year for me. But when it was a dry year, the nutrients would come up and they would basically quit taking minerals. That's how it worked. And that's how it is in the Old Testament. The, 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 it would uh, be a drought-like condition until the latter rain. And that's what it reminded me of for the last about 2,000 years or 1,000 years. Drought-like conditions as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. You look at all the religious systems, hardly anybody into the power of the Holy Ghost. You see religion everywhere, but they all know about God. Yesterday, I was watching a document about Br uh, Broma. Is, it, is that the name? Br uh, Bruma. It's a country that has been communist and terrible communist for years and years and years. Now they're building churches there, Christian churches. Is it Catholic? I don't know. But at least they're talking about God. They're planting the seed. And, and uh, what will happen is the latter rains will come. And then the first harvest was called the barley harvest. And that was what took place first, the first fruits and the barley harvest. 
And the way they would uh, thrash it and clean it, they would throw it in the air. I got this from somebody who did a study on it. And it would e be a very easy harvest. The wind would blow the way the chaff as it rose up into the air and came down. It was nice grain. And once the barley harvest was finished, then came the wheat harvest. The wheat harvest, they had to use a thing called a tribune, which they would really scrub and rub the wheat to get it out of the kernels. And then in the end, they would do the four corners. Does that sound familiar? In the, in, in the harvest, there would be the barley harvest, the first fruits. That is the rapture. Hallelujah. That's going to happen first. Gee, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ are going to leave this earth in a moment, in a split second. And then comes the tribulation, which is the wheat harvest, the man harvest. During the tribulation, millions and millions of people will turn to God. Think about it. If you're worshiping some idol in India, and an angel of the Lord flies towards you and tells you to worship God. What will you do? They worship those idols because that's all they know. That's all they've been taught. So during the tribulation, many millions of people will turn to God and many will lose their heads. Then at the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes back, he will go to the four corners of the earth and gather those who are left. Just like described in the harvesting of the Israelis during their harvest time. It's very interesting when you study. So we see the barley harvest, which is the rapture. Then the wheat harvest, which is the tribulation. And then we have the four corners of the earth. So... Here it is. The Lord is willing that none perish. If you think that he is slow on returning, remember he loves his creation and he wants everyone to get in on this incredible event that's going to happen one of these days. And the Bible teaches us it will happen very, very quickly. So who are they that are going to go up in the rapture? I'm going to teach you on that. And it's very, very interesting how the bride of Christ is given to Jesus. By whom? By the Father. The Father will say at the rapture, Son, it's time. Time to go get your bride. In John chapter 6 and verse 37. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. The big reason you are interested in Christianity, the big reason you are maybe coming to church is because you want to know about this Jesus. You want to know about going to heaven. That's the Father drawing you. You're not there by mistake. You're not interested in the things of God by mistake. It's the Father drawing you. And if you're interested in God, I don't care in what hole you're in right now. It says, those that the Father gives me shall come to me. He'll get you one way or another. I would advise you to come easy because I've seen people who did not want to come easy. They had to go through some interesting stuff. In John chapter 6 and verse 40, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will do what? I will raise him up, at the last day. So our salvation is secure. That we settled in the last five programs. 
We are a purchased possession. We are sealed on to the day of redemption. We have been bought with a price. We are not our, we don't belong to ourselves. We are not our own, the Bible says. We belong to God. God has purchased us. What was the price? You didn't pay for it. He did. He came to seek and save that which is lost. And he paid a terrible price to the point where he said, Father, if it be thy will, if there is another way, let's skip this cross business. But not my will, thy will be done. Jesus was obedient all the way to the cross. He went and paid for your sin and my sin. Now, if you want to put religion in the place of what Jesus did at the cross, you're spitting God, and not only God, you're also spitting Jesus in his face. I believe religion is the most horrible sin that a person can have, but Satan has it down pet. You're doing something for God. And every now and then I get to talk to people about their salvation, about their Christianity. They start telling me about what they're doing for God. I'm not interested in what you're doing for God. I want to know what God did for you. Because what you're doing for God is a lot of time selfishness, self-ambition, and a lot of time just something that you don't even understand. So God... What, what is he doing for you? Is he freeing you? Is he setting you free from anxiety? Is he setting you free from depression? Is he setting you free from the heartaches and the problems that Satan throws at us? From the gossip, from all these things that we as human experiences? If Jesus isn't doing that in your life, you're missing out. You're not receiving from God what you should. And he's going to finish the job one day, but it's going to be soon, and it can be very soon. John chapter 6 and verse 5, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that un believes on me shall never thirst. That's quite a statement. There's something I want to share with you as a minister of God and as somebody that's a revel somebody that brings revelation, somebody who is reconciling. How is your life with God? The older I get, the more comfortable I become. Hallelujah. Why? It is because I said it in my heart long ago that Jesus is the only one, that I'm not going to look to the left or to the right. He is the one that's going to lead me. Yes, I will make mistakes. Don't, don't be fooled by that. I will make mistakes, but God will keep me. He'll keep me on my track. And during those years, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I remember... I had 10 bucks in my pocket when I was excommunicated from a wealth, very wealthy situation. People had money, they had all to eat, they wanted, the problem was getting too fat. And did I think of maybe not being, having anything to eat? That never crossed my mind because throughout those years, my problem wasn't being too skinny. My problem was... I need to lose weight. God overabundantly gave me all I wanted and all I needed. But most of all, it wasn't only my natural food that he supplied. He supplied me with spiritual food. I was willing to take the risks of reaching out to God and getting the spiritual food that is available for me. And the reason I was willing to take the risk is because I knew that I knew that I belonged to God. 
neither death nor life nor principalities nor powers were going to separate me. So I could afford to take the risk. So it says, I'm the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. Now I have an interesting scripture which takes spiritual ears to understand. When I was studying this, I was thinking of the poor Jews and Pharisees that were listening to him. And I was wondering, I wonder what went through their minds. Then Jesus said unto them in John chapter 16, verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat, my fle eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. My flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelt in me, and I in him. They used, they used to accuse the Christians for, for operating in cannibalism in secret because that's what they would preach. You have to eat the flesh of Jesus. You have to drink the blood of Jesus. It's a spiritual metaphor here. That is in the spirit realm. You go into Jesus and he goes into you. You drink his blood and you receive his DNA. That's why I say, once I'm born again, it's that, that's for keeps. My DNA will never ever change because I drink the blood of Jesus. Life is in the blood and what? My DNA has changed from Dave to Jesus. How is that? Interesting, isn't it? We will receive a new name. The Apostle Paul says, I have wronged nobody. He could say that with a straight face, even though he persecuted the church. He brought them to, to be judged and to be put to death, but he said, I have wronged no man. Why, did the Apostle, why was the Apostle Paul on legal ground in communicating that? Because when he did these things, he wasn't called Paul. He was called Saul. A different person did this. So from now on, when you think of the things you did you were before you were born, and there's a lot of stuff that you're not proud of, think of your old name. That's not me. I have received a new name. Jesus, give it to me, and he's going to make me a pillar. So did you drink the blood of Jesus? Is the flesh of Jesus part of you? We're going to take communion today. And I want you to encourage any, everyone here. For those of you who have accepted Jesus, you're the ones that need to partake. He said, as often as you do it, remember me. I did this for you. It's a symbol of what happened in the spirit realm. The flesh and the blood, the wine and the bread, turn into a symbolic flesh and blood of Jesus. And we partake of it. And when we're born again, we're supposed to. But if you're not born again, you do not take of that sacrament because it's not meant for you. It's going to, you, all you do is you drink ordinary wine and bread or whatever we have there, it's grape juice, in today's standards, years ago, we just took wine when it was legal. But you know what? God looks on all of us. And he sees each and every heart that's here. He wants you to be thankful for what he did at the cross. You may think, well, I, I wasn't that great the last couple of weeks. I wasn't that spiritual the last couple of weeks. Forget about the last couple of weeks. How are you doing today, right now? Are you at peace with God? 
that he took your sin upon himself? Are you at peace that you are going to spend your eternity with him? If that's the case, you should be taking this incredible sacrament that the Lord left for us. So open your heart to that. Think about it. Be at peace with God because he made peace with you at the cross of Calvary. In John chapter 6 and verse 65, and he said, Therefore I say unto you that no man can come to me except it was given unto him of my Father. If you're an atheist, if you have been into uh, evolution or whatever it is you were into, if the Father is drawing you, you need to come. Because if you don't come, there is a separation one of these days. The Bible teaches us those that were not written in the Lamb's book of life were cast alive into the eternal lake of fire. It's no joke. There's preachers on TV that tell you, oh, a loving God will never send anybody to hell. Oh, yes, he will. How do I know? Because the same word that teaches that Jesus loves me also teaches that Jesus is a God of judgment. And he will not spare them that reject him. They will have to be separated from him forever and ever. No more comes this chance to turn to him once this window of time is passed. It's over. It's finished. Eternity is going to be forever and ever. Your brain, your mind, you cannot conceive it how long that is. But one thing I can say for sure, the Bible teaches us the smoke of their torment shall arise forever and ever. How about those who love the Lord? The Bible teaches us this. In the ages, ages to come, he will show us the mysteries of his grace. And how do we attain it? By simply giving him the right hand of fellowship accepting the sacrifice that he did on the cross for us, receiving the forgiveness of sin, which he gives us for free. Don't try to add on to it. Don't subtract from it. Just accept what he gives you, and he will joyfully receive you into his kingdom because this is what the Father determined for your salvation. It's not us that are going to be the ones that bring salvation. It's Jesus that did it. So let the Lord open your heart to this and bless you. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to now have communion. For those of you who are doing, I'm going to be praying. And you just, in your heart, if there's a time to be at peace with God, it's now. You may go through your week with tribulations and trials and all sorts of problems that Satan throws at you. Today I was listening to somebody who was talking about depression. He almost killed himself. But God came to him on time. And he became a powerful preacher of God. And I heard another, a, another preacher make this incredible claim. Listen to this. This may, will make sense for you. When you go to a bank, when you want to buy a big house or a, a big property, you have just a little bit of money. So you go to the bank and you, you communicate with them and you throw your money into their big money and then all of a sudden you have the power to buy this incredible uh, building that you want to build. Here is how it works with Jesus. You have a little faith. Just a little. Throw it in with the faith of Jesus. Make it one. And you will become a powerhouse for God for the rest of eternity. This is what God demands from us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace. 
I thank you, Jesus, as we partake of this bread and this wine, that you are going to bless us with joy. I pray for healing of the spirit and healing of the body for all of those here who are partaking. Lord, if there's anybody here that is not quite at peace with you, if he has accept, accepted your blood, Lord, bring peace to his heart or her heart. And Lord, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, you will open their hearts to the truth of the situation, how important it is to turn to you. So you will bless this time of sacrament, of, of your sacrifice, Lord. You, you brought this sacrament to us so that we can be reminded. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I can see waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face every fear of the unknown. I can hear all God's children singing out. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to wage lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks. The same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us, lives in us. Nothing we can do, yes we know, there are greater things in store, we will not be overtaken, we will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wait, lives in us, lives in us. when he speaks the same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us lives in us he lives in us lives in us greater is he that is living in me he's conquered our enemy no power Take.